warm welcome to everyone. My name is Matt Stadlin and I'm a presenter on LBC and it's great to have so many of you joining us from right around the world. I'm here in London in Notting Hill in my home and I'm joined of course by General Sir Rupert Smith, one of the most outstanding soldiers of his generation and also by his relatively recent wife but long-term partner Ilana Elbet. And the great excitement of this event is that both of these people are experts, absolute experts, in how to solve a crisis. And there is no bigger crisis that this world has faced, certainly in my lifetime, and I'm sure in everyone's lifetime, than the pandemic we are facing right now. So it couldn't be a better time. This is a how-to academy event, and how to solve a global crisis is on everyone's lips and none of us I don't think are quite sure that we are doing a very good job either as individual nation states or collectively as a world in solving this crisis. There is a huge amount of uncertainty and uncertainty of course is the, the very heart of attempting to solve crises. The word actually comes from the Greek word crisis and one of the definitions of the word is a turning point in a disease. The moment, the critical moment at which a disease can become worse or actually ameliorate. And while it looks like we are past the peak, at least here in Britain, there is a spectre of a second wave, something we are all desperate to avoid. Both of our guests this evening are, as I say, experts in, in crisis management. And the general was in charge, no less, of the United Nations peacekeeping effort in Bosnia in 1995. He ended up actually fighting in that year as well. He was also a very, very senior figure in NATO. And he was the Deputy Supreme Allied Commander Europe of NATO for about three years. Ilana, for her part, has also worked for the United Nations. She was a peacekeeper and also a senior policy advisor within the UN. She is right now a senior strategist as well, focusing on political risk and indeed crisis management. I'll try to give you both equal time because you're, you equally merit it. And we'll also take questions, Q&A questions from the audience as we go along on this digital platform. Of course, I prefer, I'm sure you prefer, we'd all prefer, for you not to be in Brussels, for me not to be in my home, but for us all to be together on stage in a collective environment. That is what we all hope to return to in the not too distant future. But for the moment we make do, and the How To Academy has done a fantastic job so far in carrying on during these difficult times with a whole range of interesting conversations. Let me start with you, if I may, Ilana. Would you explain to us, just outline in brief, what crisis management actually is because it almost sounds jargony but it's the subject of our conversation. It absolutely is and it's um, it's more than jargony. Um, I think I was saying to you before that you um, if you google crisis management then in 40 seconds 762 million options come up and if you google crisis communications you get 452 million so it's become a jargon in, 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 in every respect. At the core of crisis management, which starts out in the Cold War, when you uh, the, the, there was a problem of how to prevent an escalation between the sides which are the enemies, was to put in place steps that would enable um, a progression in a situation in which neither side was in control. And that is in some ways the essence of a crisis, to manage a situation in which you're not in control. It happened without anybody understanding how it arrived, but then everybody has got to find a way out of it. And um, that is, I would say, the core of any form of crisis management. Rupert may elaborate on that. The big difference I tend to find between the private sector and if you want the public sector or the world of uh, um, global crisis management as opposed to uh, a corporate crisis management is that in the corporate world it's very much focused on reputation and in somehow attaining a business situation that was the same as it was before the crisis 
Whereas in global crisis management or in a situation like we're in now, the point is to try and first of all manage the crisis. We're all in a situation that was completely unprecedented. Nobody had understood where it came from. And it has so many implications for people dying, being starving, being ill, that first of all, you're in the business of managing it and then trying to find out how it is you get to the next stage. So Rupert, you know what crisis is in, in the most frightening sense of the word, the most immediate sense of the word, perhaps, because you were actually blown up when you were serving in Northern Ireland. What have you learned from being in the field? And what can we read across from military crisis management to political crisis management? Um, being blown up isn't necessarily a crisis. Um, I mean, I think, I think many of those be, it tuning be very, in um, agree. <laughs> can be a very unpleasant experience, but it isn't necessarily a crisis. Um, there were people all around me who were in control, who put me in helicopters and all the rest of it. Um, I think uh, the most important thing in a crisis is to acknowledge to yourself that there isn't a right answer. You, if there was a right answer, then you wouldn't be having the crisis. Um, you've just used the example of me being blown up. There was a right answer when the man is blown up. This is what you do. The chaps did it, and I finished up in hospital. Um, so what, you're, what happens in a crisis is you're looking for the rightest answer in the circumstances. And the, so you must acknowledge that everybody is going to be wrong. And you've got to watch what's going on and learn from each other as to who is finding the rightest answer. And I think it's right, isn't it? And you wrote in, in, in your book, The Utility of Force, that you kind of built your career, I suppose, on trying to anticipate your enemy. So understanding that there was a, a fluidity and a flexibility to your enemy. They were not a static force. They weren't going to wait for you. And I suppose that is absolutely crucial right now. As I said in my introduction, there is so much uncertainty to the COVID-19 pandemic. We are constantly having to look round corners. And the fact that the best brains in the world, the international scientific community, to the extent that it operates as a community, hasn't yet come up with any conclusive end to this disaster is evidence of that. And the importance, therefore, of adaptability in a crisis. Uh, that's for sure. Um, I'd, I'd take it one, in order to handle that, you need to know what outcome you want um, at the end of this crisis. You almost certainly can't r reverse to the status quo ante. So what does the new future going to look like? What do I want it to look like? And then as you chart your way through all this uncertainty, you can at least maintain direction towards that desired outcome. Uh, secondly, you need to establish very quickly the nature of this crisis um, uh, and what it really is and what you can afford to do, uh, lose and what you must maintain. And then you, with those two things in mind, you can then start to make judgments. And you keep having to go through those, uh, those steps so that you're updating your information all the time. Ilana Bettel, I wonder what you say to the idea that, of course, there have been so many, as we've been talking about, mismanaged crises. To what extent can we learn from the mistakes of the past or are all crises so different that as a your historian, and I, I didn't mention that one of your roles, of course, is a historian in my introduction, but as a, as a historian, do you think we can glean from the past in order better to move forward? You can. The, the, the point about the past is not necessarily, I think that's often mistaken, that, you know, sort of, uh, we should just find out what happened in ancient Greece or in Rome or in the First World War, and then we should just do that and it'll all be fine. Um, 
if um, you learn anything from history, it is that you should uh, understand what went wrong, but understand that the next time something else will go wrong. Um, it's more important to understand the reactions and what the reactions enabled us to do. So if you look at the First World War, which is, one, is an area of expertise, then you can see that in the First World War, um, even though everybody knew there was going to be a war, when the war came, it had nothing at all to do with a war that everybody had envisaged. Even though and the, the European armies had all conscripted, they still got stuck down in trenches. The Brits hadn't conscripted, so they didn't have enough people to put in the field, and they also got stuck down in trenches. So you can never foresee the nature of a crisis. You can only say that you have to be prepared for all crises. I can tell you in advance that once we get out of COVID, you'll have a whole slew of states that will prepare for the next COVID, only to find that the next crisis will be something else entirely. But what we should learn is how to manage a crisis and what it is that you should be putting in reserve and what it is that you should be uh, willing to commit to a crisis situation. And I think that's what we've um, revealed in this crisis, which is so bad in comparison to previous ones, is that we had nothing in reserve in many places. Even though we, you know, every scenario planning situation had said there was going to be a pandemic, you come from state after state, situation after situation, and um, stocks are, are down. Um, the public health systems, while functioning fantastically well across Europe and across the Western world, and actually also in the developing world, um, they're just inadequate to the size of the situation. So I would learn much more about how the situation failed in terms of preparation as, a fault to how, as opposed to how it failed in terms of human management. In general, it's not just about preparation, it's about agility, isn't it? Agility is key when you're dealing with the, the flexibility and the fluidity that we've already alluded to in the enemy. And you know all about how difficult agility can be when you are operating in an international context. I think of 1995 when you were in charge of the UN peacekeeping mission in Bosnia and there were battalions contributed by various different member states. And that, in fact, meant that there was a rigidity to the forces on the ground, rather than the sort of flexibility and agility that presumably you, as the man in charge, would have preferred. Um, I've come back to that point, but I'd just like to add something on Ilana's point um, to reinforce it. Generals who fight the last war tend to lose the one they're in. And so you must be very careful what you take out from history. You don't just copy the past. You have to learn why it worked or didn't. Um, the, the business of agility, of course, um, and I'm sure we will find that there are institutional failures in all the capitals of, let's say, Europe for the moment, um, where people haven't been quick enough on their feet, haven't been able because of the structure and so forth to be quick on their feet. But it's, I take it a stage further. You use the example of the UN force I commanded. Um, yes, in the sense that I, these uh, battalions came from different nations. I think I had 19 different nationalities um, represented. And there were difficulties in making all that work as one. It was possible to do it. And there were great advantages in having that um, uh, uh, range of um, uh, languages, capabilities, and so forth. It, look for the advantages and use them. Don't keep complaining about the difficulties. That said, given that this is a global crisis, how well do you think the world has adapted to it and how coordinated has been the effort? Well, my first comment is this is not an original statement, but if we're all in the same boat, you can't sit at one end of it and claim that your end is still afloat while the other end is sinking. And we, we, we ought to start to understand that if we have a global crisis, we'd better start to think globally and behave globally. And I don't see that happening at the moment. 
Ilana, you, as I said earlier, work for the United Nations as a senior strategy advisor, policy advisor, and also as a peacekeeper yourself. You're partly based in Brussels, so, so you're very familiar with the European Union, which of course is a huge overarching international institution of itself. How do you feel that the EU has done in this crisis? And then to answer the question I just put to the general, on a global scale, do you think the response has been remotely adequate? I don't think it's a question of responses um, because I, I would take one step back. This was a failure of risk analysis. If somebody, go back and you'll see in the press, in media, as it's, you know, whatever it is you want to call it. We all knew about China. Uh, we all knew in January that, you know, cases were coming over into Europe, they were coming over to the States, for all we know, there were in other parts of the world. But everybody just thought that the Chinese got it wrong and it would be fine, you know, that it won't. So there was a massive, massive failure of um, understanding the threat latent in the risk. And that wasn't one state, that's across the board. And the EU actually, and funnily enough, I came across, you know, they were actually briefing the press in late January and early February to the effect that they were putting out warnings to member states that, you know, this is happening. Um, and, um, but for whatever reason, in each state and in each situation, our perception of what was happening in China was that this was a Chinese problem. This was not going to be a global problem. And that was massively, massively, massively wrong. Um, you then have a situation in Europe and across the board, but in Europe, especially as you asked me, in which each state responds individually, as though they're not in a union, not least because the EU doesn't have health competencies, so this is a health situation, so everybody responds separately. And then eventually you get it coming back to the collective, because as Rupert said, <laughs> actually, if you're on one continent and if you're on one boat, there's not very far to go, you know, you're, you're stuck together. Um, I think that the EU started out badly and has moved along rapidly, absolutely rapidly, to a much better space. Um, I think the international community, with some exceptions, um, has actually managed slightly better than Rupert is suggesting, in the simple sense that whilst if you tune out, and I know it's difficult, but if you tune out certain very, very loud politicians, um, you do see that the WHO, which is a major coordinating body, is trying terribly hard to coordinate. And if nothing else, everybody can pitch up there. Everybody being every nation in the world can pitch up there and find out what's going on and talk and, and glean from it. So it's turned into a massive and important information exchange. Where the failure is, beyond the information distribution, is on what are we all going to do about this together. The economic implications are global. The, the security implications are global. We can carry on in, you know, in, in, in that trend. And there you see the Security Council has been completely closed down. It has not been functioning for at least a decade. Um, there's no other mechanism that is truly working to coordinate properly between the different bodies of the world. And that is much more dangerous to my mind. A sense of a crisis, Sir Rupert, in the Ilana Bettel and General Sir Rupert Smith household as disagreement takes root. But this is part of the problem, isn't it? That when there is a crisis of this complexity, there are going to be different attitudes taken. And we are now as a world in the grip of the strong man. So we think of Russia's Putin, we think of, and I'm not saying that they are all of the same nature, of course, and some exist in democracies and some don't. But we think of Putin in Russia, we, we think of Bolsonaro in Brazil, we think of Donald Trump in, in, in America, and to some extent, I suppose we think maybe of Boris Johnson in Britain. How equipped is populism, is nationalism, do you think, to deal with a crisis like this? And I, I talk both, as Alana quite rightly pointed out, looking forward at the beginning of this was before it started, but also reactively, responsively. Um, well, go back to what I said about if it's a global problem, uh, you've got to handle it on a global scale. But is that possible in, in these political circumstances? Well, exactly. Um, and until 
we uh, start to use what we have, however imperfect, to do this on a global scale, um, we will go on as we are with each little national fiefdom and globally they're all little and they're actually all at the moment dependent upon each other. Um, and uh, this is going to require a degree of leadership which, as you've pointed out, I don't see. I see uh, leadership on a populist basis, which at its base is following the herd. You, 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 you're not, I'm yet to see um, any of the leaders you've mentioned um, produce some outcome, an expression of the outcome that they expect to see at, let's say at the end of this year, that they're working towards, that they're taking decisions balanced against the need to get to that outcome. As a military strategist yourself, and you of course to some extent took your orders from your political overlords, I mean you had to deal with, with the on the ground tactics and strategy, but you, you would take your command from politicians. But as a, a strategist, what do you think the outcome should be at the end of this year? What is the best outcome, given, of course, that there has been a, a, a lot of talk about trying to balance the impact of COVID as a disease, as a killer disease that makes some people very unwell, but also the needs of the economy and the knock-on impacts of lockdown, including, just for example, not enough cancer patients perhaps seeking the treatment that they need. How do you, as a strategist, juggle all of these perhaps competing, sometimes overlapping interests, and what is your goal for the end of this year? Um, a lot of the, uh, to be uh, slightly critical in my uh, uh, response, the, a lot of your uh, points, such as cancer patients, that is nothing to do with a strategic decision. You've got to think strategically, think big. And the, I, I just don't have enough knowledge to be any more specific than I'm about to be, but the future I would desire is something that learns from this global experience and so that we are better prepared for climate change so that climate change doesn't produce a crisis. It may produce a whole load of problems, but we've been there and ahead of the game and can think of thought through uh, solutions before we're suddenly faced with it, with the, the crisis. Secondly, a, for my part, I'd like to see a balancing of, between the haves and the have-nots, whether it's within uh, a, a, a national society or more uh, the, across the globe. Um, because uh, what is happening in places like the Middle East, in the refugee camps and uh, in Africa, I don't know. We're not reporting it. Um, but uh, what little I've learned is it's, uh, it's a, they're having a horrible time. Ilana, something that we forget often in a crisis is that crises are managed by human beings. We understandably, given how vulnerable we all are as individuals and as societies in the face of this threat, the like of which most of us haven't experienced before. Your husband, of course, has been to war. We're not at war, we're not being shot at, but we haven't experienced this sort of change and threat to our lifestyles before. We can forget that those in whose hands our futures lie are themselves human beings with husbands and wives and children and hopes and fears. And I noticed in the Commons today in the House, Houses of Parliament during Prime Minister's questions that both Matt Hancock, the Health Secretary, and Boris Johnson looked absolutely shattered. Now, this speaks nothing to my politics, and I think that they have both, and the government itself has made manifold mistakes in this crisis. And, and when you make mistakes in this sort of crisis, it could be a question of life and death. But they're both human beings. They both had the virus and they've both got huge responsibility on their on their shoulders. Do you think we do sometimes lose sight of the vulnerability or at least the humanity of the people who's who are in charge of it? I think 
think that's always the case at, at, at one level or another. But you're asking a question about leadership, and leadership is, is, is um, a quality that diffuses humanity whilst being completely um, fused with it, if you want to put it that way. So you're basically saying, shouldn't we give them a break because they've had the virus and they're very tired? First of all, if they're very tired, they should get some sleep. Um, any crisis is not made better by um, the, somebody, who, whoever's meant to be leading the situation, not getting enough sleep. They should deputize and be very clear what they expect their deputies to do. Um, in the same manner, um, you have to ask yourself, um, why are they out there at the front? If they're not capable of it, they should make sure that somebody is capable of it to be there out at the front. Because the point about a national crisis, a global crisis, and again, I would use this in, in contrast to uh, 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 the, the, the private sector, is that you have a lot of people who have no idea what's going on. You have to assume that all of your audience out there, your citizens, the global citizens, don't know what's going on. They don't know what caused this. They don't know where it's going. They don't know what you're really doing to make it better for them. So it's up to you to be in a situation, if you're the leader or if you're the management at a certain level, you're there for them. In the private sector, you're there to defend your reputation so that your share price remains solid. If you're a global leader in a global crisis, you're there to make sure that your people are secure and feel better for seeing you in one way or another. If you're tired and shot to pieces because you've had the virus and you haven't had enough sleep, go home and put somebody else there in front of you. And I mean that quite seriously. The other point is that should a leader be out there all the time? Um, the, and if you look, there's various models across the board. Um, in many ways, it's much more important to put out a really good spokesman that everybody knows has the, uh, the ear and the authority of the leader, but not the leader themselves, because then you have somewhere to escalate to. If the most senior person is out there the whole time, you've got nowhere to escalate to. They've already said everything. So if they're wrong, or if they didn't get it right, or if they look tired, there's nobody else you can go to. General, for centuries, generals and, and princes and kings would do the opposite of what Ilana has just recommended. They would physically head up their forces. Just think of Agincourt and Henry V, for example. You yourself were a man who was in the thick of things, even when you were at the very top. I think of the Gulf War in 1991. You're in charge in Germany and you then almost overnight were charged with assembling a 35,000 strong British ground force in Iraq. And you were widely praised for the success of that mission and under the, ultimately the American leadership but you did brilliantly and you were rewarded with honours uh, at military honours as well. How did you manage to combine being a, a leader and also a man as it were who got his hands dirty because to some extent if we go back to Boris Johnson in a very different context he's part of the story that he's leading. He got the disease himself. We are all part of this story. How did you manage to juggle that? Juggle your own personal risk with being in charge of 35,000 men and the risks attached to their lives? Um, yeah, uh, it wasn't 35,000 my bit. My bit was only about 22. The, just, just, the, just the 22. <laughs> yeah, the, um, uh, there were the other two services involved as well. Um, the, um, I think it's quite helpful in these circumstances to ask yourself, why should someone follow a leader? Um, and the, if order to get that person to follow that leader, it, it, that person could be sitting in his armchair, but he's, he's with that leader and the direction the leader is taking events into. Um, the, the person who uh, follows a leader is trust or is confident in the first instance that the leader knows where he's going. Um, it, 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 he has to believe this man knows where he's going this, and so forth. Um, secondly, he has to believe that this man can get him there can show him the way there, how to get there, what the direction is, 
and so forth. And lastly, he has to be confident this man will look after him on the way. That doesn't mean to say he's going to survive, but he will be uh, given the best shot. Now, that is how, uh, if you, to answer your specific question, uh, what I would argue I tried to do was to satisfy those three criteria. I want to just pause for a moment to reflect on the importance of, of language and communication. And Ilana, I'll come back to you in a, in, a, in a second. But first of all, General, what do you make of delegation? Ilana's already talked about the need sometimes for deputies to deputise, even in the heat of a crisis, perhaps more than ever in the heat of the crisis. But, but what about delegating to the people, delegating to the masses, those that are being led by you. And, and I think specifically of this controversial phrase, well, it's a doubly controversial phrase because Boris Johnson has exhorted us in this country, in the UK, to use common sense, but not just common sense in interpreting the rules, but British common sense, which is playing to, to, to all sorts of uh, politics, isn't it? And perhaps reminding us of the, the entrenched positions over, over Brexit. And it's also possibly about making sure that if it all goes terribly wrong, we as the public take our share of responsibility. Do, do you think that's an abrogation of responsibility by the Prime Minister to talk about common sense and, and, and also to include the it, it rather absurd and exceptionist idea that there's a particularly British brand of common sense? Um, I, I think the British brand of common sense is... is uh, um, nice for us Brits to talk about, but it's not an exportable idea. <laughs> the, the, um, uh, let's talk about delegation and answer your first question. I, I considered uh, delegation is a function of leadership. Um, and leadership is not being in control of everything. You delegate control uh, to the people who stand closest to their problem and are able to understand the context or situation, circumstances they're in. So um, prescribing um, activities and then telling people to do something else is bound to lead to confusion. And we have structures in our states um, county councils, mayors, and so forth, um, all of whom could have authority and responsibilities dedicated to them. The authority and the responsibility should be in the same hands um, to interpret the general direction um, according to their circumstances. Now, we'd have to go and examine particular cases and to tell, decide where that is, it, it, where this decision lies. Um, but it all involves delegation. And my guess is that the tired men you've seen um, are failing to delegate and are trying to keep control of something that is uncontrollable. That's why it's a crisis. Ilana, I know that, as your husband said, Early, you don't copy the past, but we do still at, at least attempt to learn from the past. And I think of the what, what many would describe as what well, was obviously an environmental disaster, but you, some would describe it as a, a disaster in crisis management as well. The, the 2010 BP oil spill, and, and I think specifically to, to the moment when Tony Hayward, who was then the chief executive was photographed, I, I think, on his boat off the Isle of Wight. And that was seen as a PR disaster and was criticised heavily, I think, by the United States government, certainly by people in America, as being deeply insensitive. It was, in fact, two months after the oil spill and he was defended by BP as this was his first day off or few hours off in the crisis. And what you've just said suggests that you do need to have some time off, you do need to rest. But nonetheless, the messages that you're sending out, the, the PR war, the, the communications, are very, very important part, aren't they, of crisis management? 
hugely important. In that particular case, it seemed to me that, um, um, first of all, he had put himself out forward for most of the crisis. So he was the face of the company. And therefore, when he was seen sailing, um, it seemed very callous. If he um, had not been the person identified the most with the crisis throughout the coverage of it, it wouldn't have been such a problem in the first place. The second place was that there was, it seemed to me that there was a complete misunderstanding there. Um, he and the company perceived this as an engineering crisis, whereas the rest of the world saw it as an oil spill, uh, people being killed, uh, environmental crisis. So the nature of the crisis itself wasn't particularly clear to those who, who were dealing with it. Um, and this brings me back actually to your question to Rupert before. Um, I think that we have the same problem here, which is that um, in as much as whilst Rupert calls it, what do you want the end outcome to be, then most people would say getting a vaccine. Now that isn't actually an outcome, that is a, a necessity but that's not an outcome of crisis. Um, and there's a very big difference. So everybody's focused on the vaccine and the vaccine war before you even get into who's responsible for the crisis and did China do this or did the US do that or did anybody do something else? But the focus on the vaccine and on the medication or even on the health systems completely obliterates what is the outcome that you desire after the crisis. Um, those two, both maintaining that your health systems and um, finding a vaccine are necessities. They're not outcomes in one way or another. And they're going to happen no matter what you do. So therefore, Rupert's point is very, very valid. Where do you want to be afterwards? So today, for example, you asked me about the EU. So we know over the past two days that quite to everyone's surprise, suddenly um, uh, Chancellor Merkel of Germany and, and President Macron of, uh, of France have announced that they want to create a massive uh, recovery fund and move the EU in a completely different direction that everybody had supposed before. Leave the politics out of it, is this correct, incorrect? But this is the first time you're hearing where they want the EU to end up afterwards. In the UK, we're yet to hear where we expect the UK to end up. In the US, it's much the same thing. The leaders in both countries, and I'm just using those two because you mentioned them, are still harking back to either the status quo ante, we just want everything to be as good as it was beforehand, or else the one of them is fighting an, ele an election and the other one is desperate to get everything back to where it was good when he won an election. So neither of them, those are the only outcomes they seem to be focused on in one way or another, which is why we find them so difficult to watch because they're meant to be global leaders as opposed to reputation managers. So Rupert, are there advantages in competition when you're dealing with a crisis? So many are calling for a more united global effort and we've touched on that already. But for example, in the pursuit of a vaccine, if Oxford is competing with London or parts of London University or if Britain is competing with America. Can, can you see from your own experience that there might be some pluses there or do you only see minuses? Well, to a point, competition uh, spurs people on. Um, I want my laboratory to uh, be the winner. That, that's fine. But uh, it's if you then take it to a next stage where you refuse to share you, uh, this becomes a, um, you know, um, a sort of zero sum game in the, in the competition. Uh, that's ridiculous. And if you've got leaders um, uh, uh, of, of competent leaders, they will go and stop that sort of negative competition because it isn't going to produce you the results you want. And if you want an example of this, Look at, if you go back to the uh, uh, days of the 30s and the Second World War, <clears throat> you will see the air forces um, having lots of different airplanes from different manufacturers. They were all in competition, but out of that competition, they produced some winning airplanes. And it's the same process that is happening with the laboratories today. We may not be able to find a virus. Uh, yes, we haven't, fact, cracked, we haven't yeah. cracked the common cold yet. I, I want to ask you as well, 
this is a slightly different question to agility, but it's 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 part of the same area because I want to talk to you about organization. As a, a military man, organization is, is central to your capacity to fulfill a task. Have you been sympathetic or critical of what appears to be the slowness in Britain's on the ground reaction to this virus? And by that, I mean the, the, the apparent slowness in getting up to a position where we can test effectively. We haven't got to the point that now yet where we can properly contact Trace yet. We abandoned that in early to mid-March. And of course, the, the, the catastrophic and tragic shambles that seems to have taken hold in some of our care homes. Are you, are you sympathetic on any level because this is a, a challenge of such great magnitude and because civil society and, and our political structures are not trained in the way that the military is, or are you critical? Um, I think you can be both in these circumstances. The, uh, uh, I go back to what I said at the beginning, you're looking for the rightest answer, and the moment it stops being the rightest answer, stop doing it and do something else. Um, the, uh, the organization is, need, my impression is that, uh, and it is only an impression, is that firstly, authorities and responsibilities have not been delegated. So they, however much you've got a structure, <laughs> it can't work if it's being run from the top all the time. Um, secondly, is that you, uh, and this I'm, I'm sure is the case in some places at least, um, in order to, to save money and uh, reduce expenditure, for almost the last 30 years, um, <clears throat> we've followed a, a fiscal logic in deciding whether or not uh, 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 to, th that organization is fat or thin and, and, and remove people because people have cost money. And of course, the thing you need when you um, face a crisis is at least a few more people all the time, or people, very flexible people, very knowledgeable people, practical people, who you can change, uh, give different instructions to, different orders. Ilana, how frequently occurring as a threat is panic in a crisis? And I, and I mean, not just panic by those who are being organized by the people in our case or by troops in Sir Rupert's case, but I also mean amongst the leadership. Constantly. Um, that is why leadership is, is, and delegation is so terribly important. I think the one thing we haven't talked about in any crisis that's really important is the constant gathering of information and dissemination of information. Um, and that's really important also to your point of panic. The more you know, the less you're, you're likely to panic. Um, good crisis management really, really relies on gathering constant information and making sure you're communicating it, first of all, to, to the audiences that could panic, so in this case to your citizens, but equally also to your fellow leaders and making sure that everybody's on the same page. And that's why our global institutions are so important. And as I say, that's why I do think that the WHO at a certain level has functioned correctly because it has allowed everybody to come together and get information. Whether it's enough information, you could argue all kinds of things. But I can assure you that in every government, in every head of state and head of government's office, in every head of a health authority somewhere, be it in Africa, be it in America, be it in Europe, there are people constantly trying to find out what's going on and feeding that information into a system of decision making. The decision making fails where, as Rupert says, if you don't know what you're trying to decide, if you're just constantly putting out fires, you're not making decision. Your decisions, you're putting out fires and that's a big distinction. And Rupert, I, I wonder, this is a slight variation of that same question, but moving away from panic to rigidity. So I, I don't know whether you've ever encountered this in your career as, a, as a, a military man and strategist, or whether you see any evidence of this in the current crisis, 
but the extent to which a leader or a leadership group, once they have decided to cleave to a particular route, they're, they're going down a particular path, if they realise that actually this is looking pretty dicey and that they're on the wrong path, how tempting is it to stick to that path almost at all costs, or at least not to deviate from it for whatever reason, saving face would be a corrupt reason, until it's too late? Um, the, all of those um, um, examples you've given are, are uh, it, very much part of human nature, and we're all vulnerable to them. Um, to, to go back to a tiny bit, the, uh, you don't tend to get panicking in, a, in, a, in the um, big organizations and so forth in the sense I understand the word panic. Uh, what you can get is a failure to think new thoughts and go on doing what I've always done. Uh, the example you've just asked about banging on at the same problem in the same way is just an extreme example of it. And uh, the other thing that goes, uh, people go on in the safety of their assumptions that they made about the problem to start with. And nobody is checking whether these assumptions are correct. And so you often get cases where people go on trying to put doing something that's inappropriate and you find the reason is because they've assumed certain, uh, certain things. Um, have, you, have you, sorry to interrupt, but Ilana, have you noticed a, a particular or a surprising compliance on the part of European populations or indeed the American population with the instruction of their leadership? I think there was, there was the thinking that the British government was rather surprised by ex exactly how literally the British population had taken its advice to stay at home. How do you see the relationship between state and citizen in this crisis? I think it's a very important one. Um, I think it's a situation of trust, um, especially in democracies. And um, I think citizens expect that trust not to be abused. Um, at the beginning of the crisis, for sure, and definitely the first few weeks of it, everybody was afraid. Let's, let's be very, very clear. I think a lot of people were complying as much because they were good citizens as that they were afraid. They were watching what happened in China, they were watching what happened in Italy, they were watching what happened in Spain, and this is a faceless enemy. So a faceless enemy appears to be even more dangerous to some than a faced enemy um, in one way or another. Um, I'm not surprised at this compliance because citizenship is about trusting your leadership. I think the places in which we're seeing that that is slightly um, wearing at the sides is for two reasons. One of them is where you see situations of less trust and, you know, for example, in Brazil, where you see that the governors of the states um, have given out completely different instructions than um, the head of state. And most people are following the governors of the states and staying home. I think the other thing is that we're seeing now is, well, not that many people have died, despite the fact that a lot of people have died and it's okay to come out, but people want to know how to come out. And I think unless there's clarity in most states in which there's been clarity as to how this is happening, it's happening well. In those states in which it's, there's no clarity, you're seeing greater frustration in one way or another. But as the, 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 the facelessness stops being such a, a threat, I think, to people, um, you're seeing more and more, well, sod it, I'm just going to come out. And General Sir Rupert Smith, I want to finish before we move to the, the, the Q&A from, from those who are contributing. And thank you to everyone who's contributing and, and also just being a participant. It's great to be part of this community with you. But General, I, I want you to take us into the war room to the extent you're allowed to. <laughs> and the nuts and bolts of crisis management. So you're sitting there in, a, in the war room in Bosnia or, or, or in Iraq or, or maybe in, in, in some way in Kosovo. I don't think you fought in Kosovo, but you were, you were part of the strategic management of, of the part of the campaign there. What's the mood like? How important is hierarchy and a clear chain of command? 
to what extent was your leadership based on a democratization? So you would, you, you would encourage your men and women to, to speak up and, and to contribute? Because there, there are those who, who are experts in, in leadership who, who think that it, it can be a very narrow-minded leader who doesn't take into account the views of others, and that can lead to dead ends of the, of the, the like of which we were just mentioning. What sort of leader were you? And, and what was the sort of atmosphere that you encouraged in that moment of crisis? Um, you must ask those I've led uh, as to their opinion of my leadership. The, um, I'm, uh, I, would, I would like to think that the first thing about your war room, uh, ops room, whatever we want to call it, is that it's a place of calmness. It is a place that your subordinates want to come to so that they uh, uh, get the advice, the help they need. Um, secondly, remember all the other people in there with you are your staff. They're there supporting you. And as if you imagine it like a huge brain, then they're all cells in this brain and they better know what you want to do and where you're going. Otherwise, they can't help you. And they often have better ideas than you do, so it's worth listening to them. And it doesn't matter what the chap's rank is. Um, uh, I don't care. If he's part of my staff, then that's, uh, he can talk to me and he can tell me what he thinks. Um, that's really the sum of it. Ilana, how does it work in, in your household when you have two experts in crisis management actually living together? And I, I haven't pointed out yet, but you are in the same home right now. You're just in different Dif rooms. Different, different floors. <laughs> There's no crises ever. We just manage them. <laughs> Very good answer. A Q&A here. So Alejandre has, has messaged in to ask why were national governments not prepared for this crisis? There's a lot of assumption in, in that question. And will there be any measures in the future, do you think, to, imp to implement rigid frameworks to stop this from happening again? And I, I suppose I'd question the word rigid there because I would have thought that a certain amount of flexibility and agility are required given that each crisis, as you've already pointed out, General, is of a slightly different nature. Shall I answer first? Yes, yeah, please. Um, I can only speak for Britain, uh, but I think Britain was prepared for this crisis. It, the fact that we didn't, um, uh, that we knew that this was a, the, a threat as far back as the Defence and Security Review of 15. Um, we have a biosecurity strategy. I think that came out in 18. There's was exercises or an exercise conducted in uh, 19. Um, I'm not sure what more you needed to do to prepare for this crisis in your head. But what doesn't seem to have happened is you've built the stockpiles and so forth uh, to manage the crisis. And one of the things you have to do if you are uh, doing this planning in advance is to work out how quickly you have, uh, uh, or the time you have, to react usefully um, should this threat appear. If you want a quick example, we put our seat belts on when we go into our cars and go for a drive. We do that because there isn't time in the crash to put it on and prevent yourself being impaled on the steering column. Now, Ilana, brief, brief, sorry, briefly, Ilana, or do you have more to say, Rupert, on that? No, 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 I, that's... I think the problem isn't that we didn't know. We didn't um, resource the preparations, and that's a very big difference. You can commission as many reports and do as many exercises as you want, but if you don't put the resources up against it... So in France, um, you know, they have the same problem with masks. In the UK, we had huge problems in terms of actually uh, um, getting the system up and running. Um, and then we have a PPE issue. Um, this is a repeated place. The political timeline is short. 
the fact that somebody commissions a report or we do an exercise under one government doesn't mean that the next one will be doing the same thing. The priorities change. We have focus groups that decide all kinds of things. It's the usual story, but it's the resources that are important as opposed to just, I mean, of course, the report and of course the planning, but if you don't resource them, then it's just not going to happen. And, and general, there's a risk, isn't there, with, with politics, maybe particularly British politics and, and the politics of some other countries as well. Germany might be slightly better at this, I, I've heard, but I could be wrong. But there, there's a risk of short-termism, isn't there? Not, not just a risk, there's a preponderance of it. And you need to prepare long-term for this sort of crisis. And I was heartened to hear you say that maybe we need to learn the lessons of this and project them onto the fight against climate change so that we are properly or better prepared for that, for that catastrophe should it arise. I, I just wonder what you say to, to Richard, who says, does the concept of securing and maintaining the initiative make sense in crisis management? And how does this relate in managing the current COVID challenge? Um, the, the underpinning idea of having the initiative, um, I, would, uh, I think, applies. What you're trying to do in these circumstances is as it were get ahead of the game so you can you you've got the test kits you've got these things in place um you have the capacity uh to to, to um in your laboratories the you and so on and so forth and then you can start very very difficult with a uh, a, a disease that you can't cure but you start to be able to to dictate how you're doing, because you have the capacity to do more than just react. I've, I've got a question I want to direct to you, to you Ilana, in just a, a second. But first, to stay with you, General, I, I wonder the importance of messaging. We've talked about communications. We've talked about PR in a crisis. We've also, to some extent, talked about hierarchy and clarity of message. And one of the big threats to that is fake news outside of your control. So when you were running 22,000 troops in Iraq and however many thousands in, in Bosnia, you at least had the advantage that there was that chain of command. You could control the messaging. You couldn't control the enemy, or you might try to. You, couldn't, but you, you could only control what you could. Fake news makes that much, much more difficult, doesn't it, for politicians? Uh, and, and indeed, I suppose, in military settings in, in the modern world. And David asks, says, fake news, conspiracy theories have become a major force in shaping public opinion globally. And he worries that social media companies might be tempted by the, by the clicks. How do we fight back? Um, I, I think the first step, at least, is to do what Ilana said, is you must have a centre uh, that produces absolute reliable tested information and it's available to all and uh, it, it's a, it can become a reference point against which other information is tested but you've got to, that's got to be trusted and uh, just and it's it's there's all sorts of things like this uh, you've used the Bosnia example uh, 19 different states, I'm communicating to 19 different capitals. Um, so what do you do? I get spokesmen for every language and make sure that the right language is being spoken to the right audience. The last Hello, thing, right. Sorry. a British general talking to your um, Bangladeshi audience isn't going to help anybody. And there's a real risk, of course, in, in multicultural, multiracial societies, especially with nascent populations, new populations, that the messaging from on top doesn't get through. Correct. One worry that that may be partly why BAME, BAME communities are suffering disproportionately. We, we don't have the no, evidence, but no, it's a suggestion. But, but certainly you need to be able to get the, the thing, whatever you want to get across, it's got to be true, trusted to be true, and in a form that is understood by your audience. There's time for two or three more quick questions. Roseg asks, Ilana, whether you're talking about better preparation or more agility, you are referring to the need for states and institutions to be more resilient. 
how will states and institutions be able to pay for new resilience in the face of the unfolding economic crisis? Just take the example of national health services. In other words, the possibility that one crisis might breed another crisis. It's not a possibility, it's nearly an assurance in that particular case. We're all about to go broke. So, you know, we know that there's going to be less money. Preparation and resourcing isn't always just about money. It's about pre-allocating where, um, in the case of something happening, where are we going to put our effort? It's about being sure that the, the resources that you have know that they're going to go there in one way or another. It's about the fact that um, if we do have an economic crisis, as is unfolding, and a financial crisis, that we've decided in advance, these are the elements of the population that we're defending and that we know that we cannot abandon, um, as Rupert said in the have and have not scenario, because this will only make the situation worse. It's, that's what preparation and resilience is about. It's not just about how much money you're throwing at a problem. It's about planning, it's about being clear what resources you have to start with, how can you back them up, but above all where they're going and how quickly you can get them there. Do you think as a historian, we can learn, Ilana, from the 2007-2008 crash. Duncan mentions it and says the pandemic has caused a worldwide economic crisis. In the 2007-8, the G20 under the leadership of the US and the UK met three times at leader level and charted a way out of that crisis. What is the G20, says currently chaired by Saudi Arabia, doing now? Is the global economic coordination adequate? And if not, why not? And I suppose, just to supplement that question, there is a risk, isn't there, that we're so focused on the, the, the COVID health threat, quite rightly at the moment, that the looming economic crisis is something we might take our eyes off. Um, I think the problem actually isn't just that we're focused on COVID. I think that the problem is also that you're having a row between at least two of the members of your G7, which is the US and uh, um, China. You have Russia nearly out of the game because currently uh, um, their own COVID situation is so bad. You have uh, um, various other elements going on that make it a moving a field that is very, very hard to grasp. So I don't think that you have any form of leadership on the economic or indeed on the political side, which is actually only making the crisis worse. Um, what I would say about the 2007 and 2008 crisis is that there you also had a very clear idea quite quickly where it is that you wanted to end up, which wasn't necessarily one that turned out to be the best one, but nonetheless, it was about saving the banking system in order to, because that the assumption there was that if you save the banking system, then that would save everybody else. So you, very quickly, you had an idea of what your aim was and how to get out of the crisis or where you were going. Here, as Rupert said, as I said before, nobody seems to have really much of an idea. But the first time we've had an idea in Europe was yesterday with Merkel and Macron saying that they have some sort of idea of where they want Europe to go. Globally, nothing. Just briefly before I round up with, with one final question to you each, Bex asks, does Alana think that there have been crisis managers advising the British government? We had too much guided by the science. Where are the crisis managers? Is it too late to, do a re, to regain and get back the trust from the country? You think the care home crisis will not go away? Is more honesty needed? Yes. Because that's about trust, isn't it? Without honesty yes. and transparency and the yes. government has been accused of, of, of misleading us, they would deny it and do deny it, of course, but where there isn't honesty or there is the perception of a lack of honesty, then there's a lack of trust. And then how do you get people back to school if people are still angry and distrustful about the, ha the care home crisis? One leads to the other. And it also brings in this very important question and lots of, of people in this crisis think journalists should just give the government a break, not scrutinize power. This isn't the time for journalistic scrutiny or as they might see it journalistic point scoring but actually if you don't hold the government to account for its recent mistakes in a crisis surely it's more likely that they will make further mistakes in this particular in in crisis management honesty is the best policy honesty doesn't mean saying everything but it means everything that you say should be true and it so means I just want to, to, yeah. to round up both with you Ilana in a moment as a historian but also with you general sir rupert smith as a military man how much scope is there for optimism here? Um, uh, one should always uh, <laughs> look for the, for the 
uh, more optimistic view or you'll just wind yourself down into a hole. The, um, so yes, there's scope for it. Um, but you need, again, leadership to start to maximize the good things and get rid of the bad things, whatever they are in these particular circumstances. Um, our optimism as to where we will finish up in the future, um, I don't know what the answer is, but we'll probably be living with this disease forever and we might not have a cure for it. Um, and we're going to have to find a way of living with it and recover our economic uh, situations at the same time. And a, sub, a, sub, a subset of that question, General, is you mentioned leadership. We haven't really talked about charisma and personality. You said that I needed to ask your men how they saw you as a leader. So I won't ask you whether you were charismatic as a leader, but although he's been accused of all sorts of things, including incompetence, one thing that Boris Johnson does bring to this crisis, not so much perhaps today in, in Parliament, where, as I say, he looked pretty exhausted, but he does bring a certain optimism. And he does have the power, at least, to galvanise some, some many millions, ah. exhorting us to, to get through this. How important is personality in crisis management, just finally? Oh, that, you know, is all about leadership. Um, I, I just make a point about optimism, because I don't think I answered your question as you posed it. Um, using the, you, you can only be optimistic to those you're leading on the basis of um, their trust and what, and what you're being optimistic about. Um, if you just claim that the future is going to be lovely, um, then that isn't being optimistic. That's illusions. Ilana Bethel? Go on. <laughs> I think that um, I'm not at all optimistic about the crisis management. I'm optimistic that the crisis will move on into a better place, partly because young people wish to get on with their lives. And so far, a lot of the focus of the crisis has been with older people, uh, partly because in every crisis there is an opportunity, so many different people have said that. So if it's, um, as Rupert said, about climate change, that this will lead into, if you have a shattered economy, when you rebuild it, you might as well rebuild it in a, in a greener way. Um, the crisis will get better. The management, I don't think, well, I'm sorry to say. Before I sum up and thank you both, I've been fascinated. I haven't been able to find out where does your name originate from, Betel? Because, uh, Ilana, Betel, I, I wonder, could it be Israeli? Where is it from? And also the general, Sir Rupert Smith, sounds terribly English, but your father was a, a, a very famous New Zealand military man who ended up, I think, in, in the RAF, having been a hero in, the world, in, in World War II. To for, for the New Zealand Air Force, as far as I understand it? Uh, 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 I'll let Alana answer about her name first. My name is Israeli, and um, um, every so often, when especially when our son was little, we used to get stopped at airports, and by the time they'd been through, um, I'm Israeli from a, a Canadian father and a British mother who met in Israel and I grew up there and Rupert's father is from New Zealand and we met in Bosnia and my son was born in Brussels and they usually just let us through because they couldn't work it out anymore. <laughs> <laughs> was I right in your own history? Um, not, not, I mean, yes, I carry a New Zealand passport, which can be extremely convenient on occasions. And um, my father was a fighter pilot in the Royal Air Force, not the New Zealand Air Force, he, he came over for the war and um, stayed on in the Air Force um, into the 60s. I so enjoyed talking to you that in a sentence, I've got one last question, I can't, I'm, I'm too tempted, one last question for each, each of you. In a sentence, can you get better as a, as a, as a crisis manager? If you, if you make a career out of advising people in crisis management, or if you are a, 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 a general, do you get better at it? Oh yes, the Dale Carnegie always applies every day in every way. But yes, you can get better if you come to understand that it's not about you, it's about the situation and the people who are watching you and expecting you to resolve it, you get better and better at it all the time. 
Is that true, General? Because, of course, politicians don't necessarily have that luxury. You, Boris Johnson had only been prime minister for a matter of months. Nor do generals. Like Nor do generals. 50% of generals lose. Not the most optimistic <laughs> note on which, on which to finish, but we are in the middle of still of a pandemic. <laughs> it, it's been brilliant to speak to you both. I've done many live events, not so many live Zoom events, but this is the first husband and wife combination. It was very effective. I, I, and I can see, even though you're in different rooms, that you clearly have a harmonious household and you apply your crisis management techniques to your own, <laughs> your own lives. Very good to have you both with us at the How To Academy. Thank you to everyone who's been tuning in from right around the world. It's great to have such a big audience. We've got lots, lots more events at How To Academy throughout the summer to keep you interested, informed, and I hope entertained during these strange times. There is a sense of community, even though we can't see you. We know you're there and we're very grateful for your presence. So do please sign up to many more events in the near future. You can find me at Matthew Stadlin on Twitter and Instagram, and you can join me on my LBC shows early hours, Saturday and Sunday morning. I've been Matt Stadlin. This has been General Sir Rupert Smith and his wife, Ilana Bettel, or should I say Ilana Bettel and her husband, General Sir Rupert Smith. It's been brilliant to have you both. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.